you know, Torlock has been a huge part of my story. Like, it's, it's really awesome to be here and, and to know so many people and familiar faces. Uh, so this is on bootstrapping. And I thought I would, I'm super excited for this because it's, you guys kind of see me through the YouTube channel, but to be honest, the machine thing uh, has always sort of been uh, just a step along the way. Uh, it's not that I don't love machine, but to me it was more about uh, the journey uh, from making stuff in, in a small business standpoint. So um, let's talk about sort of five things in this talk. Who am I? What is entrepreneurship? What is bootstrapping? Um, building your ORT, which I'll come back to, um, and how Tormach fits into that. And then this idea of sort of what is a 21st century business model. Um, so for me, I grew up in uh, Southeast Ohio. I went to Babson College, which is known as it's the number one school in the country for entrepreneurship, and I majored in entrepreneurship. Um, went to New York City for a 10-year detour where I had a day job, and that day job is actually a big part of my story uh, for how I got to where I am, even though totally unrelated to uh, machining, metalworking, etc. And as Andy mentioned, um, my wife, I, and now two-year-old moved back to Ohio about two years ago, back to Zanesville, that same town where I grew up. Um, so my bootstrapping and small business journey started the year I graduated college in 2005. I had grown up as a competitive shooter, and I wanted a better target. So this is sort of the quintessential, like, what most people think of as uh, a business pursuit, but for me at the time, it was really more of a product pursuit. And I wanted a target that I could shoot at long ranges, it would fall down and reset itself. So I hired engineers, I hired a machine shop. Um, our Babson College was partnered with the, the Olin College, which at the time was in its second year of giving 20 incredibly smart kids you know, full rides to a world-class engineering program and started figuring this out. So we spent a lot of money, had this prototype design, had it machined, and um, what, was the next? Uh, what happened was this part here. So that part is attached to this DC gear, DC brush motor on the other side, and that is what reset this target. And this part, which I keep on my desk to this day, really upsets me because it's a great example of why engineers are terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> Completely overdesigned. Completely. I mean, terribly so, and I didn't understand it. Um, I am sincere in that in 2006, I didn't know what a bridge port was, I didn't know what an end mill was, I had no clue how this part was made, um, I didn't know how to improve it, but I knew it needed improved, it bothered me. And I think, probably like a lot of you in this room, I was the kind of guy that wanted to be hands-on, I wanted to learn, I wanted to kind of, to, to do it all. Um, so for me, that meant buying this tag CNC, uh, this has become sort of a famous photo in our story because that is the pillow to my twin bed in a one-bedroom apartment in New York City. Um, and I made it work. I wanted to buy a benchtop mill. My goal was never to be a machinist. It was simply I wanted to be able to pick up a phone and talk to a machine shop or talk to an engineer and have a conversation. Um, and I thought, I'll buy this little CNC. I'll learn enough to talk after a year, and it'll, it will move on. I won't keep it or whatever. Um, to fast forward to today, uh, I run this little company called Saunders Machine Works. We sort of do four things, uh, a job shop, our NYC CNC YouTube channel, we offer CNC training classes in our James Wall High facility, and we make some of our own products. Uh, this is sort of a recycled slide um, from another presentation where at the center was Tormach and Fusion 360, which I left in here because the truth is honestly, and anybody who's followed our YouTube channel can see this, they've been a huge part of our story. Tormach really from the beginning, Fusion really more in the last year or so. Um, I also um, still run a small rifle target company called Rimfire Steel. Um, that was a company which I'll come back to in a second called Strikemark. Um, and I also own a small real estate company where we manage some properties. Um, so what is an entrepreneur? The sort of Webster's definition is a person who organizes and operates a business taking on greater than normal financial risk. So I bolded the latter half of that sentence because um, it's not that it's not appropriate, it's that to me it was something I was never interested in doing. I just, um, I'm not that person. And it's a thing, thing I'll come back to at the end, which is you have to be honest with yourself. 
Uh, not in the cliched sense, but I was not the kind of guy who was ever going to say, um, I'm quitting my day job, I'm throwing it all out on the line. You know, especially now, I have a family and a kid. And to me, I kind of wanted to have my cake and eat it too. For a long time, that meant I kept my day job and I did all this stuff on the side. Um, but going back to what is an entrepreneur, for me, it's execution. Um, I truly believe that ideas are, uh, it's not that they are worthless, it's that they're worth very little. Uh, what is worth something is somebody's ability to build a team and organization and the resources around an idea or a product and make that into a company. And I, I mentioned this and I actually use Torbach. Torbach is a great example. I don't think anybody in this room here today would say that Tormach is simply the 1100, sort of their flagship product that's been there from the beginning. Tormach is a true company. It's R&D, it's innovative, it has a full product line, it has a supply chain, a support system, with pre and post sales. It's a true company. But it started with an idea, but it took that idea and executed on it. Executing is hard, um, but it's also really fun. Uh, so what is bootstrapping? Um, I don't know what bootstrapping is, uh, but when I was putting my slides together, I, this is what kind of came to mind. You know, for me, it's not that you're creating something from nothing, but you're creating something from something very little. Um, it's this idea of you don't have to be rich or wealthy, nor do you have to go massively into debt. You know, starting with a very little amount of capital, using cash flow to, to grow. Uh, I wanted to go to Babson College because I wanted to understand about business. And one of the things I've learned and always been fascinated with is, you know, a lot of small businesses fail because of cash flow. You know, if you, you guys are accounting gurus, you know that, you know, an accrual sale, you know, someone paying something or someone buying something from you is different than them paying you for it. So understanding cash flow and using that cash flow or sort of retained earnings um, that you've made to, to grow your company, go to the next stage. Um, avoiding risk. You know, debt isn't always bad. Um, but if any of you listen to like Dave Ramsey, um, I don't agree with everything Dave says, but as a general rule, uh, it's pretty hard to screw up big in life if you do your best to avoid debt. Um, it's also just a mindset and attitude. I think it goes back to how I was raised and what I wanted to, to get out of life, which is to, you know kind of work your butt off, um, be resourceful, be crafty. Uh, John Grimms when I talk every Friday morning, and, and John had this great saying, which is, I want to be able to do anything, but that doesn't mean I should do everything. Um, which is this idea that for me, I want to know how to, to machine something or powder coat something or design something or help build a website. But that doesn't mean I should always do it. But for me as a bootstrapper, it's really helpful because when I hire somebody or I partner with somebody or I'm looking for a vendor or a criteria, you kind of got to know enough to make those decisions uh, in sweat equity. I mean, to me, that's the American dream. It's just literally work work your butt off. I, um, I love what I do. It doesn't feel like work. I love what I do. So this idea that it's sweat equity in a bad way isn't, just isn't at all. Um, so going back to uh, that Target company, um, we made the targets. We iterated a version two. Um, we got them out. We, we sold them. It was pretty cool. Uh, we managed to get some government contracts, but they never took off like, you know, you know our crazy pro forma upside. What did happen was we bought a Tormach machine because I wanted out of Manhattan. I wanted the ability to do more, you know, a real amount of work which our little tank couldn't do. Um, it's funny because, God, 440, actually it's a good thing that 440 didn't exist because then I never would have left Manhattan. Um, but I wanted to leave Manhattan to get a 1100. And we wanted to film uh, promotional footage of us shooting these targets. So we had a Tormach. I was like, hey, let's mount cameras to guns. So we made this mount, um, and I still have one here. You guys can pass that around if you want. And that was a the first ever mount to put a GoPro onto what's called a Picatinny rail. And we made it for GoPros, for contour cameras, for DSLRs, for point and shoots, for us. But we went to these ranges, to these events, and everybody, it's kind of like that depressing moment where everyone's like, yeah, cool target, where do I get the camera mount? So, so, but 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 follow follow the money, not in a sellout way, in a way where you have to realize, wait a minute here. I wanted to create a target company. Um, we sold the target, but the targets were expensive. These mounts were great, and so that's what we did. Um, and we did we made a lot of them, and it was it was perfect timing because I just had my tag long enough and my tour where I started to understand stuff. No joke, 
This is the first fixture I ever made. Some carling clamps that spread out, and this fit 32 of our little mounts on there. I could get home from my job and I could get two shifts of these in a night on my, on my tour walk in my basement. And we were selling, we sold a lot of these things, you know, some days five or 10, some days 30 or 40. Um, this is another picture of just you know, mining them up afterwards and we set them out for anodized. And it was, it was awesome because here I am, uh, I, you know, it's okay that the target company didn't take off quite like I thought because here we're, we're crushing it. This is what was happening. Um, it felt good. It felt like a chance for me to really now take this machine from just a, hey, let's make a new bracket to we've got a product here that we can focus on. Um, so again, it was this idea of going from this little tag that helped me get my feet wet um, to, this was actually our second shop, still in Manhattan. Uh, this was huge for me. It's, uh, it's actually funny. It's called a Junior 4 because they, it's too small for them to legally call it a two-bedroom. But the second room here was my little shop. Um, and then, you know, kind of coming back to the bootstrapping mentality, when we moved out to the suburbs, after I bought my 1100, we bought a Torchmate plasma machine, which is great. Having a CNC plasma is a game changer. Again, this is all in my home, like my house. So this is incredible to me to be able to do this stuff. But unfortunately, my wife got pregnant, which meant I wasn't allowed to use the plasma in the house anymore. The plasma dust isn't probably like the best thing. So uh, I put the plasma on wheels and I would wheel it out into my driveway. This is like in a New York residential neighborhood where nobody owned trucks, nobody mowed their lawn. And here I am like wheeling the plasma machine out into the driveway to run a batch of parts. Um, and then again, going back to the tour mock, that's what really helped me, um, you know, here, it's like, it was so little money relative. I mean, literally our tour mock was less than the first prototype we made, paying the sheet metal shop, the machine shop, uh, all that. So it was a no-brainer there. Um, so just talk specifically about why we thought the tour mock was a good decision or why, what, you should, what you should consider. Um, I usually get two questions. Should I build my own? DIY, or should I buy a used VMC? You know, very different um, approaches. There's nothing wrong with either. From a bootstrapping standpoint, um, I would remind you that most people focus on money. Money is usually the limiting resource for folks. That may be true, but time is the other one. And time, in many respects, is more uh, precious. So DIY is awesome. If I had nothing to do, tomorrow or next week or the next year, I would love to do more DIY machines or retrofit machines. It would be super fun and fascinating. But the truth is, as a bootstrapping company, my opinion is you're much better off purchasing a machine that is able to do what you need to do, which is prototype, R&D, light production. So that's my hedge against the DIY. Um, I haven't looked at a build cost lately, but I don't suspect you're really even saving that much, not counting for your time. Uh, nor the risk and complications and so forth. Um, a used VMC, I usually just respond to say, if you're comfortable, if you have to ask the question, you shouldn't be buying one. Um, used VMCs can be great. They can also be um, rigging, three-phase, why is it being sold? How much is that first service call going to cost? Um, there's, there's some upsides, but a lot of sort of caveats. And it's also, it wouldn't have changed what we had done um, or were able to do. Um, from, its, from a cost standpoint, even if you have the money, bootstrapping is all about preserving what you've got. So businesses need a lot of capital aside from for equipment, inventory, working capital, managing that cash flow. Um, for Tormach, to me, um, it's one reason why I'm really glad that they do this event, is a chance to see the company that has sustained power. It's a, what do you call it, an employee stock, ESOP? Yeah, so, all the employees that you're meeting today own the company. Is that, that correct, Andy? Yeah, really, really a cool thing. They've got skin in the game. Tormach isn't a, there's a couple other companies out there that are, you know, one or two guys in a garage. I'm not sure they're gonna be around in 10 years. Um, a really great community and user base. Um, I'm proud to be part of that. And a lot of the people that own Tormox have been through similar stories. They're interested and happy to share and talk. It's generally not an it. A, uh, exclusive, you know, leave me alone, this is private, this is confidential, you know. Walked into a lot of machine shops, uh, you know, uh, walked in and they said, you know, you can't come back, you can't look at anything, turn prints over, blah, blah, blah. Kind of like that. Um, no joke, half pilot. I didn't 
really care or understand what Pat Kelly would do for us versus Mach 3 because it's just it's just runs the machine. But it's been huge for reliability, and we now have two employees, and the ease of use for that, amazing. Um, you know, we've got, there's a buddy of mine on Instagram where his wife is out there uh, running the Tormach for him. They're bootstrapping their startup. They're, they're, they're making it happen, and it's that easy to use. Um, section 179, talk to your account. There's different tax treatment for purchasing new equipment versus used equipment, bonus depreciation. Um, like it or not, Bootstrapping is about preserving capital, and if there are perfectly legitimate, normal ways to pay less taxes, that's more business or more money for you to grow your business. Um, they're easy to move, whether that means relocating the machine while you're doing projects, whether you're moving from a garage to another shop, um, it, it's quite helpful. I, I have to pay to rig five machines next week that we bought old manual machines. Rigging space, it's like literally not fun to do. Um, for us now, we have multiple Torbox, so we have the ability to run them on dedicated setups, dedicated operations, um, more than one person, or one person per machine, it's great. Um, and then new stuff that I think is pretty cool, you guys have seen the rapid turn today, uh, we've used a probe in our Tormach to reverse engineer parts by plot pointing it and looking at what the, the X, Y, or the Z value is, and being able to basically put a part in a vise and kind of build it and pull the dimensions out. Um, so that thing I said earlier called ORT, that was uh, an acronym from my college, Vapsin, which stands for Opportunity, Resources, and Team. And it's kind of one of these you know, catchy buzzwords for something you should think about if you're building a small business. You need an opportunity. Most people think the opportunity is a product, and, and while I will agree with that superficially, really the, the, that, that product, that opportunity, needs to answer a why. Um, you know, for Tormach and 1100, that, that may be the product, but the why is everyone here who wants the ability to make stuff at home or make a better, have a better quality machine and be able to produce parts or, or I think your slogan is enable your ideas. That's kind of the why. Um, the team and the resources are more important. If you talk to a venture capitalist, they will invest in a B plus or a B idea with an A team they will never invest in an A plus idea with a B team. It'll never happen. The team and the resources really matter. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, this thing called solopreneurship or entrepreneurship at a small level, small business. So for me, my team is really just me. Um, that uh, Target company the, and the camera company, that was a partnership and it did not end well. Uh, I would be happy to talk about partnerships if anybody would like to, to have that conversation at the end or offline. Um, I like running my business with myself. Um, that doesn't mean you're the only pers person in your team. You have vendors, you have partners, you've got distributors, consultants, advisors. You, you know, you need other people. They're a key part of your business, period. Um, but then resources is really probably the most direct when it comes to bootstrapping. Um, can you afford a machine? Can you have that in your shop? If not, how do you, I mean, the conversation before this, the makerspace, that's incredible. That wasn't around 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The equipment didn't even exist then. But figuring out from a business plan standpoint, how are you gonna get what you need? I call it OPE, other people's equipment. It's a good thing. Um, you know, some people's makerspace, school, I've heard of folks that work at shops that'll let them work um, overtime or after hours. Uh, on their equipment, um, it's a good way. So you kind of be, you know, being resourceful, being scrappy, figuring out how to get what you need to get. Knowledge and technology, obviously, you need to. to for me, um, you know, YouTube. Did, that's why we started. Was I learned through CNC Zone, through some of the Yahoo groups. There were some people that were really nice, and explained, answered, and wrote things out, and I thought. If I'm interested in this, at least a few other people must be interested. I had a digital camera, and I actually had a buddy from an email, uh, email from a buddy, Mike, who sent me this email in 2006 and said, Saunders, really good website for internet videos, www.youtube.com. I'm playing, right? Um, so I just started posting on YouTube as a way to kind of pay it back, but also hope that if I'm posting something and sharing it, um, other people will be more willing to help me, uh, which was a big part of, um, you know, it was a big part of building your team and, and resources of knowledge and so forth. A, a couple of, of tidbits here. Um, 
I love the saying, I don't know who said it, fail fast and fail cheap. I don't care if you fail, just fail fast, fail cheap. There's no reason. I could bring a product to market in a week. I have a big shop now. I have a shop with four Tormach milling machines, a Tormach lathe, a grinder, a variety of other equipment, tooled up accessories, under 100 grand. Seriously. That, that's, that took me a long time to build up to, but that is a very little amount of money in the grand scheme of a small business, a company, what we produce in revenue, etc. Um, be honest with yourself. This is really, really important um, for everything. I will work with somebody or hire somebody or, or whatever when they are willing to say, I don't know. The scariest thing to me is somebody who wants to pretend or mislead you into being able to do something they're not comfortable with, or misrepresent their ability. That's scary. You need to also do that with yourself. It's okay not to know. It's okay to not be interested in something. Don't start a company or start an interest if you don't think it's sincere, it's there. I couldn't do, we've done 104 straight videos on Wednesdays. That's a pain in the ass. I love doing it though. You can't, you couldn't pay me enough money to do that if I, I didn't truly love it. So just be honest with yourself. Um, one of the things I would really encourage for folks out there that um, want to do something full time. For me, I kept my day job a really long time. I actually liked my day job, but really it was about being able to take those additional risks and have that comfort of benefits, paycheck, some stability, another option. You know, I wasn't cutting off that career or, or you know option that didn't work out. But don't don't make the two related. Don't accelerate um, your or your interest in pursuing an opportunity full time just because you don't like what you're doing in your day job. Those two are unrelated, going back to being honest with yourself. Um, and then something we're living through right now, and this goes back to being honest with it, is I'm realizing that I am a bootstrapper. And that's really not a good thing for our business and the stage that we're in. Um, I really should be comfortable spending more money and outsourcing some stuff and letting some just, I'm realizing I'm a bootstrapper at heart. I'm frugal. Uh, I don't think I'm cheap. I just am very conscious of, and it's because I think I spent 10 years doing it and it got me to where I am. And it's hard for me to let go. And again, I remember at college, they talked about how you know CEOs of companies are not good as companies grow. And I never understood that. I think because I was young and I thought, no, a smart person can, can adapt and be that. And I'm like, now I realize it. You know, I'm in some respect not the best leader for my company in its current form. It's a me, one employee, one intern. It's not like I have a chance to change a CEO, but um, it's something I have to be conscious of and think about as we as we kind of tackle the next year. Um, so this idea of what 21st century business model, you know, looking to some of the other guys, uh, John Grimsmo, there's uh, many people now that you guys may have known or seen on Kickstarter or other social media places that have become tremendously successful and I think probably really personally fulfilled doing this stuff, solopreneurship, making stuff, a small business, delivering products out of their house. Um, this isn't the most fully baked slide, but um, you know, there is social media. I, I have kind of mixed feelings on Kickstarter. It seems like it may have kind of run its course. I don't know, I'm not an expert on it, um, but there's still things like that out there to get your word out, to raise money. Um, we use Shopify for our website. It's phenomenal for what we do for fulfilling orders, for tracking stuff, for logistics. That stuff matters. Um, our camera mount company, uh, my wife and I used to pack them all up every night and we'd be like drive to the train station in the morning and stuff like 20 to 30 envelopes in the like corner mailbox. And then we finally realized this is, this is ridiculous. And so we found a third party logistics provider that could handle all our stuff. That was stressful. You, you think when, when you're selling this much and you're making money that somebody all of a sudden just tells you what the answers are. And the reality is no. Um, and you've got to go research it and figure it out and that gets, that gets stressful. And, and again, time, that was a great example. We were making money. Time was the limiting factor. Um, but the, one of the biggest things, one of the proudest things I am is that, is again, that camera mount because we, we, we prototyped it in-house, not even with the intent of being a product. Then we prototyped it in R&D as a product. Then we produced them as a product. If you go look, there's some videos where we did our first powder coating video, which is actually that thing. Um, then the first run that I actually sent out 
to be outside machine was a thousand. And I didn't think a thing about ordering a thousand. I had that confidence. I knew the design was down. I knew what to ask for. I knew to, the, to ask the machine shop about their ID tolerance on the Picatinny rail because we knew some were out of spec and we needed to widen that groove. And we knew about the 1032 and to relieve it in a certain area. I cannot tell you how valuable the confidence was because as a bootstrapper, I wanted to learn, I wanted to do it. Um, and maybe that's a good example of where I was, it was easy to then stop being a bootstrapper and push it out and do so in a way that was, it just felt great. Um, I do not have one more slide. Um, I had a couple of notes though to make sure I mentioned. Um, oh yeah, so uh, one thing to think about again is and, and tying this into Tormach is um, going back to the target company. We bought the Tormach because we needed the ability to prototype in-house. Um, but because the Tormach was relatively low cost and a nimble machine that you could use for a lot of different purposes, we weren't pigeonholed into being a target company. Because as a small business, you know, my opinion is you don't necessarily know where it's going to take you. So being able to stay nimble meant this machine that kind of was meant to be one purpose got shifted over to another. If you buy a $100,000 machine that only does one thing, you are really in love and committed to that one thing. Um, and, oh, and then, you know, nowadays, you know, we have been thinking about a bigger machine and what's next for us, but um, I kind of had this great moment when we hired a summer intern, and he's in high school, he's 17 years old, um, he seemed very, he seemed great when we interviewed, and he came in for the first day, and I was super busy, and I was like, I uh, don't you know, I need to get him working. So I made him a little Fusion private video. I was like, go watch this, go redo it yourself, do it three times, get it down. It's a simple part, 2D contour adapt. And then he did it, and he was like, I'm good. I'm like, you're really good? After like what, two hours, he's like, yeah, I can do that. I was like, go run on the machine. And I, I didn't care. I mean, what the worst he's gonna do on our 1100 is break a tool, you know, crash the part into the spindle of the device, that's actually kind of hard to do, especially when you're watching the thing. So it was this confidence level of, holy cow, this is great. Um, and it's, it's actually been a great story. He's uh, was there yesterday with me here making parts, which is which is awesome. So that's my talk on Bootstrap. Questions? John, part of being a small company selling service, in uh, sometimes selling service to, to other upstarts who have kind of unrealistic expectations of how the world works. Sure. Do you have anything entertaining to share with us as far as... Um, Say it again. Do you have anything entertaining to share with us as far as educating your customers as to how you can help them and how the world works so that uh, you can actually make a relationship out of what's maybe just a dreamer looking for uh, help, looking for free help? You mean just entrepreneurs that think, you know, the whole like, well, I'm going to capture 1% of the market and that's, you know, $14 million a year. And you'll make the parts for him to get started on credit or yeah, we'll design the parts or something. No, we get those emails. I mean, it's a simple no. I mean, I'm not, I'm not looking for partnerships there. I don't know any machine shop that would really respond to that. Um, the short answer, which some people don't like because my generation or some people just, they want it all right now. For me, you can do a lot of things in life if you take your time and stay focused. And for me, we got a lot of people ask, you know, how are you in this huge shop now? And it took me eight years. I mean, I worked, literally, most people don't want to do something for eight years and not have immediate, happy, great results. Um, and it's as simple as, look, put 50 bucks aside every week and come back in two years. You'll have, two, you know, what, uh, $10,000, $20,000. So how important is your website versus web presence? You know, I know a lot of people find you through like YouTube videos and stuff like that versus, you know, having your own dedicated website, you know, you know. We use a website to sell some of our products, but no, I don't pay attention to my organic SEO or track for visitors. It was important for Stripemark, but okay. that was very important. And that was a company where we spent, um, you know, we were spending about $3,000 a month on AdWords. You know, it was a very, that was an SEO company. You, we needed to be the top result for or organic, for pay, for YouTube, um, because that was the strategy there to get people to buy our maps. If you 
care what was the day job and what did it give you that that is the bootstrap effort, both kind of like in a mechanical or knowledge or, or journey type of way? Yeah, I didn't relate at all. I worked for a real estate uh, investing company. So there were six of us and we uh, had properties all over the US. It only ties back into th this story in that, um, in that, uh, which why I was it comfortable. I bought the building that we're in right now. So because I worked in commercial real estate, I felt comfortable tackling that. Um, and certainly I did a lot of financial analysis. So um, I'm better in Excel than I am in Fusion, which is kind of sad. Um, but just the ability to like build a budget out, build a model out, look at that kind of stuff. It's very comfortable speaking that language. And presumably it's a stain in your head. It, you lived off oh, absolutely. But look, I mean, I have no problem, you know, um, uh, I think John Grimson was talking about this in his video, so I, I'm sure you won't mind me saying it. You know, his wife worked for a while and got the benefits and he did his thing. If that's what you need to do, do it. Um, what I don't, you know, be honest with yourself. I have friends or people that are much more successful. They've thrown it all to the wind and they're running big companies now. It's not me. It's just not me. I'm okay that my company's going to grow slower. It may have limitations. Um, I don't aspire to have a big payroll. I want to influence a lot of people. So I'm struggling with how do you, what does Saunders look like in five years? I don't know. Um, what I do know is I generally stay out of debt and I try to be honest with myself and enjoy what I do so that it's all sustainable. I hear that in, in your point of entrepreneur and bootstrapper being very, very different. As a bootstrapper, your set of goals, where you're going, what your destination is, looks very different. Than Absolutely. So, so, and you spoke a little bit of what is that goal? For me? Yeah. yeah. Do you know? Well, no you said idea. you mentioned it. You <laughs> financial independence, you described. Uh, so do you, I'm a therapist, so I've always shoot for a goal. Let's talk more later. <laughs> so what's out there? Do you see something polluting you? I, um, I feel grateful I've been able to, to do what I've done. I kind of, it's weird, I'm talking out loud. I live in the present. I love what I get to do tomorrow, so I don't need, if I could criticize, criticize myself, I miss, you know, those days with, with Strike Mark where I took 30, so the mounts cost us about $3 to make. It's not counting on the time. And they, they sold for 30 to $50. When you take 20 of those to the mailbox two weeks in a row, you start feeling pretty good about yourself. Um, not because money is what makes you happy, but because for me, it's a sign that society is validating what you're doing. You know, I don't care about my YouTube statistics other than the fact that it means, hey, there's people that enjoy what you do. That's a good thing. Keep doing it. At what point did you decide you actually quit your day job and actually do this? Not, not specifically, I mean, was it something you had a lot of opportunity, you had a product that really went well, and that's what made you feel comfortable actually like quitting? Yeah. And how long did you really wait that out and you say, okay, this is running too long enough, this is actually something sustainable? It actually was, it ended up being other factors, which I'll explain, but um, I, I, I would, I give my, so I worked for a company with six people, and I really, um, the boss that I worked for for 10 years, or nine years, I really had a lot of respect for, he was a great guy, really lucky to work for him, and I actually tried to quit my job a year uh, before I ended up leaving, and I told him, I still, actually, I got caught, his kid was in science class, and they ended up watching one of our videos uh, in like sixth grade, and his mom, I, I don't know if I got caught, but it was like, this is weird. Like, this is close to home. Um, so I told, I like spilled the beans. I was like, I'm putting my two weeks notice. We're going to go crush it with this target company. And he was like, okay, hold on. And he like, let's look through all the numbers, talk about the whole thing. And he's like, dude, um, keep, keep, keep going for another year or six months and see where you're at. And it's funny because in some respects, um, I might be in a different place had I done that, you know. Um, there's a whole other story about where those mounts could have gone, which we didn't, you know, we didn't innovate to get to a quick disconnect. We probably could have, blah, blah, blah. But um, I'm happy with that decision. Why, why I ended up leaving was, uh, I never wanted to stay in New York City. My wife and I had a kid. Um, I wanted to get out. We weren't sure it was going to be Ohio, but it was that time. And uh, I just wanted to move on. So that, that whole break made sense. Frankly, the business was um, good enough. To, to, in my opinion, justify making that break by that point. Yeah. Could you could you talk more on maker spaces and what's your thoughts on those and just extend maybe more on that? 
Yeah, I actually don't have a ton of experience with them. Um, there's one, in, there's some in Columbus. Um, I know friends that use them. I think it's phenomenal because my understanding is it's very likely that you can accelerate that curve of, uh, I, I listened to some of Chris's talk, you know, you don't have to start from scratch. Like, um, you know, when I started this 10 years ago, like we tried Sheet Cam, we tried Bobcat Cam, we tried Rhino, we tried one CNC, like it was a nightmare. Now it's like, that's one reason why I'm like, stop asking questions, just go use Fusion, buy a Tormach, and if you wanna buy another machine, because you know that it's a better machine, then you buy it, sure. um, but do it. Like, I use all that stuff to let me do what I want to do, not because I'm a fanboy of either one of them. It's just a very, sometimes you don't, sometimes more options is bad. Um, so being in a makerspace where somebody can say, hey, the, the um, epilogue laser on acrylic, run it at 650 setting and you're going to get a good result. Phenomenal, you know, avoiding reinventing the wheel. Um, my advice, if you're going to try to go to a place like that, is try to figure out a way you can be a good guy. Try to give something back, or if you can bring something to the table, because um, you know, just like when I I started going door to door to machine shops when I had products in hand, those mounts, the targets. Let me tell you, showing up at a shop, not an mounts, like but, you know, being there and having a part in hand was a such a different conversation than a phone call or an email, being like, "Can you quote me five, twenty, fifty, one hundred, two fifty, three thousand? You're like. That they saw that your passion, they saw that you had been invested in this, you actually had a part that made sense. Um, same thing with the makerspace, I guess. Try to, okay. yeah. Um, I can't, your current business sounds like it's more service oriented than it is product oriented, or am I misinterpreting? Mm -hmm. you, you know, your, your camera mount is very much a product. Yeah, that's true, yes. It's wonderful because you can, there's no limit. Right. There's no time limit. When you're in service, you can only sell your time once. So, so do you, does it bother you or do you think about how you can get back being product oriented? Yeah, all the time. I mean, we have a product right now out with some beta units, which I'm excited for. It'll never be as many as the, the camera mounts. Um, you know, products are great. Uh, I will tell you products are, can be a pain in the ass. You know, uh, work in progress, inventory, recalls, changes, warranties, post-sale support, returns, or like it's, there's headaches as well. Um, but I will tell you that this is what I spend most of my time on, the YouTube channel, which is a product. It has infinite reach and it doesn't have the hassles affiliated with products or job shop work where you're doing smaller runs and trade-offs. So I still do some of the job shop work myself. I try to most of it to be done by Jared, the guy who works for me, or our intern. Um, and I honestly do the job shop work because it pushes me. I, that's actually I forgot to mention that in my speech, but when we bought the Tormach, um, we, I don't even know how, we just started taking on like friends, family, like people, job shop work, nothing crazy, but I, it pushed me outside of my comfort zone to learn and do parts that I didn't design, which makes you think more, and it brought in a little bit of money. We we're actually kind of surprised at um, how much it brought in. It's, I don't, there's this weird dichotomy in the country where you see so many old machine shops and factories closing up, but me, my friends, there's this, there's like, we haven't had a slow day in two years. Um, and I'm not God's gift to the machine. I like what I do, but I'm not a great machinist. I just, um, frankly, from a job shop standpoint, I'm not selling the machine part. I'm selling the experience of working with us. Like, I I, I don't care if you don't speak my language, the machinist language, because that's what I went through. I called machine shops and they'd say, what's your tolerance? And I didn't know you answered that in thousands of an inch. I thought it was a fraction of an inch. I didn't know. So I'm kind of sympathetic to people in that uh, position. Have you dealt with um, Patreon at all? Yeah, Patreon is, a, I mean, Patreon is another part of this. You know, the YouTube channel is a business. Um, you know, Tormach sponsors us. So I can spend the time I spend because the folks that help us make that worthwhile. And Patreon is part of that. If you don't know, Patreon is um, basically, a, you you pay a dollar a month, five dollars a month to me every month and it's a way of supporting what we do and then you get we do a couple things a monthly live chat where we all talk on web cameras and you can ask me anything you want we're a little bit more open or q a and then uh, when we do cad files or arduino projects that we can share we'll post the cad model or the code to the patreon site it's a way of just saying thank you for the folks that support us i wondered how successful that has been as far as adventure into that 
it's, it's all public. I think our Patreon is about 950 bucks a month. We, we call it a wrap. Any other questions? Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it.